And the next topic uh, is going to require us actually to, to um, remember Snell's Law all over again. And I've given you an expression for it uh, on the screen there. And you remember the classic one in terms of refractive index is this one down at the bottom. But we also wrote it out in terms of ratios <coughs> of wave speeds uh, and or wavelengths in, um, in two media. So the example on the screen uh, is of, and remember we're now talking about electromagnetic waves particularly, is of, uh, let's say, light coming into this interface here. So some angle of incidence, whatever that might be, uh, and then it's being refracted into medium two. And you'll notice in this case, the angle of refraction is shown larger than the angle of incidence, right? Which implies uh, that we've got a refractive index in this medium, which is higher than the refractive index in that medium. Okay? So this is like light coming to the edge of a glass block and then out into air, say. Right, that would be one example uh, of that. But the important bit to notice is that the angle of refraction is greater than the angle of incidence, right? So as we take the angle of incidence up, we're going to get this angle of refraction getting progressively uh, bigger and bigger. Um, what is this doing? This is doing very much what I said just now apart from this last bit, all right? So as this angle goes up, angle of incidence goes up, so this angle of refraction goes up faster, right? R is bigger than I, remember, uh, in this setup. So we're going to get to a point where this angle becomes 90 degrees. In other words, our refracted ray actually goes along the interface. And that's the point at which sine of R is equal to 1, right? We're not going to go any further with Snell's law than that. That's the point at which Snell's law ceases. But the key thing is that whatever the angle of incidence is for R to reach 90 degrees, that is what we <coughs> refer to hereafter as the critical angle. Okay? Uh, and it's a critical angle that becomes hugely important. So let's pick this up again and, and demonstrate it. So here's the same sort of setup. An angle of incidence is a slightly greater angle of refraction. And then we get to this point, the critical angle here, where our angle of refraction now has become <coughs> 90 degrees. <coughs> All right, so if we assume that this is, say, something like glass or water, whatever, uh, and up here we've got something like air, so in other words, this refractive index is greater than this refractive index, then this is always going to hold true. There will always be a critical angle at which the angle of refraction will become 90 degrees. So if we stick that back in our simple version of Snell's law, I'm assuming now the medium up here is air, remember, so n equals 1 for air, uh, then we can actually work out what the critical angle is going to be, because we've got our expression here for Snell's law with n2 being 1 in this case. The angle of refraction has become 90 degrees. That's easy, sine 90 is just 1. Uh, and the thing we want to work out then is the angle, uh, the critical angle uh, of incidence. All right? So the refractive index of this medium down here is equal to 1 over sine of the critical angle. All right? So if we take the inverse sine, we get whatever that critical angle might be. All right? Now, when that happens, this is the critical angle that we've just defined on the previous slide. We can still, of course, take the angle of incidence up. There's nothing to stop us doing that physically. But we're no longer going to get a refraction effect. And actually, what takes over at that point is something called total internal reflection. So beyond the critical angle, we'll have a situation where this interface between the two media behaves like a perfect mirror. Okay? So we've now actually got this angle of incidence greater than the critical angle and this will just be an angle of reflection now. It'll be the same thing, whatever that angle might be. Okay, so our interface is now behaving, as I say, like a perfect mirror. Excuse me. And this is what's going to drive 
the whole of optical fibers technology for us. Right? This is exactly how they're going to work. So we're going to put light into our optical fiber uh, and we're going to do so in such a way that the angle of incidence at this interface between the glass fiber and whatever the cladding is around that fiber is going to be greater than the critical angle. So all of the light now gets totally internally reflected as though this interface is behaving like a perfect mirror and it just bounces along <coughs> through the glass and comes out the other end. Right? That's the essence of how an optical fiber uh, will work. Right? Now there's practical things in here. I'll show you some, uh, a little bit of evidence of how this was uh, overcome in a slide or two's time basically associated with how much <coughs> absorption there is in a glass. Right? You need actually a very, very high quality glass for this to work over kilometers, right? which is what fiber optic cabling has to cope with. Um, you know, a window glass looks fairly transparent as you look at it from the side, but I guess a lot of you will have seen what a glass sheet looks like if you look end on. It's a long way from being transparent. You can never see through uh, edge to edge <coughs> of a glass sheet. Lots of light scattering <coughs> and absorption going on. You don't notice looking at it from the side because it's thin enough not to cause a great deal of absorption or um, distortion. But next time you get a chance, look at a piece of glass edge on and try and look through the length of it and you'll find that it's really, really quite difficult. So producing fiber optic cables is a non-trivial <coughs> technological exercise. Uh, and this is, this is when it was cracked. This is 1970, uh, lab book of a guy <coughs> called Donald Keck who was working for, I think, IBM uh, at the time. And this is, I've just enlarged this little bit up here, this is the first time that he produced what he knew was going to be a commercially viable fiber optic. Okay, so we're only talking about four decades. Um, it says three on there, but it's four, I can't count, right? Four decades. Uh, for this to have, the whole thing to have developed from this very, very first bench top demonstration of a working fiber to what is essentially um, the cabling of the world in terms of fast communications. Um, and look at the measure he's using for the attenuation, for the loss of light as it goes through the fiber. He's actually using a logarithmic decibel scale. So this isn't now in the context of sound, but it's the same sort of maths that you're now familiar with. He's actually looking at the loss in terms of decibels per kilometer. Those are his units. Right? And he's got it down now to 17 decibels per kilometer. And that was the point at which it was going to work. And you know, you can see even physicists get quite excited by what they do. But valuable is why I've enlarged a slightly bigger section. Really, really good experimental method. I've produced something that's really exciting. Now I've got to go away and do it again and again and again and again to prove that it's reproducible and reliable and so on. Um, so it's quite, I think that's quite an interesting bit of history there. You might not, I do. Um, so physically, what do they look like? Well, they vary a lot. Um, they've got a diameter that varies, actually I would take that lower number now down to about one micron for modern uh, fiber optic cables, but it's a few microns typically in diameter. Um, and then around that you put some cladding. Now remember you've always got to have a cladding that has a much lower refractive index than the glass, otherwise we're never going to get total internal reflection. So the cladding is, is usually some sort of hydrocarbon or plastic, right, which will have a low refractive index. So it's not going to be quite one, it's not going to be like air, but you've got to wrap this stuff up in something. It's, you know, a one micron glass fiber is not the strongest thing in the world. Uh, and we need to protect it from water and all sorts, of other, all sorts of other things. And then everything else on the outside of that uh, is engineering. Um, you know, are you going to use this as an endoscope, putting it down someone's alimentary canal, or are you going to run it under the seabed for international communications? What are you going to do with it? And that will determine everything else that goes on the outside of that initial bit of, um, of cladding. 
Um, yeah, I was going to sort of demonstrate. I've got some bits <coughs> and pieces. But I did some years ago um, some research on non-linear fibre optic materials, so I've got some odd artefacts from, from there. This is... Uh, I'll pass it around if you like, because it's quite hard to see from here. Uh, this is a bit of the beginning of a fibre optic cable. Right, now this is a rather specialised one. It's got a core in here, which is non-linear optical material. So it's used in, in um, uh, optical computing and switching and amplifying and that sort of thing, which you know, you're going to know about at the moment. But the key thing is you'll have a rod of this stuff, maybe half a metre long. All right, so both ends get gripped in a pair of jaws of some sort or another. And then basically you draw a fibre. So you have a, a ring heater around one end of this, which will slowly melt, you know, it's all obviously very tightly controlled, slowly melt the glass and you pull away the bottom drawer, run it over a drum and then the drum starts rotating and so on. And out of this rod, you'll get several kilometers of optical fiber. Right? So we're really drawing down this diameter quite markedly. Um, there's a slight blue colouring, you're just about to pick out, I guess, in the core in here, which is about a millimetre in the middle. Uh, and that's because this glass is doped with something called neolinium, which has some really rather interesting non-linear properties. So I'll pass it around just for you to have a look, but please let me have it back again, because I don't know a lot of these left now. Thank you. Um, and just to demonstrate it again, really crudely, uh, this is... This is actually a fibre optic cable, but made out of plastic. Plastic, right? There's a Perspex core in here, it's cheating. Uh, but exactly the same physical physical principle is, is holding. The plastic cladding around the Perspex has a lower refractive index than the Perspex. So we're going to get total internal reflection. Now you wouldn't transmit light over kilometres with this stuff, it would all be absorbed away in the Perspex. But, um, I can at least demonstrate that it will work. I'll have to take the lights out. Yeah. But just with my laser pointer, if I put that in one end, we should. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Coming out the other side. And it is just total in internal reflection going on as the light travels around that coil and comes back out the other side again. Right? That is the physical process that's taking place here. I should have done that in front of the camera. <laughs> that will teach people to turn up to lectures. Um, what have I got in here? Some actual fibre optic cables somewhere in here. Right, just a bunch of cables. Some of you will have seen this stuff. You know, you can get plastic versions of this in in Christmas trees. For goodness' sake, I mean, I have. Be honest with you, I think they look But, um, you know, they're around a lot, right? Every garden centre from November onwards will have dozens and dozens of Christmas trees made out of fibre optic cable. And again, it'll be plastic stuff like this, it won't be glass. Because um, it's only travelling over short distances, I'm not sure how many. I can probably illuminate about three of these simultaneously. Right? So it's common or garden, everyday stuff, basically. I'll show you some more bits and pieces later on um, as we get to it. I don't think this is actually going to be <coughs> terribly useful for now. I was going to tell you a little bit about... Because you can get this stuff happening with microwaves as well. <coughs> Your microwave cooker the microwaves, microwaves get piped essentially from where they're being generated into the resonant cavity where the food is using a process of essentially wave guiding which is entirely the analogue of these. And uh, the next topic we need to talk about is polarisation. Right? We're going to talk about diffraction and so on. But let's talk about polarisation first. Um, if we've got transverse waves, we established right at the very beginning that we could polarise them, right? And I showed you a really simplistic cartoon of a vibration on a piece of string and there was a sort of rectangular slot through which 
uh, that vibration could pass. If it was aligned with that slot, it was called polarized. If it was flicking around all over the place, it was not polarized. Well, the same thing is true of electromagnetic waves. Because they are transverse, right? Remember the electric field and the magnetic field are oscillating at right angles to the direction of motion of our electromagnetic wave. That means that we should be able to polarize them, and indeed we can, and it's relatively easy to demonstrate. It is the reason why, at least in simple radio systems, the aerial has to be in the same alignment as the receiving area, so it has to be in the same alignment as the transmitting area for you to be able to pick up a reasonable signal. It's never particularly clean to demonstrate this in the real world because radio waves are being reflected and bounced around all over the place, so it gets a bit muddled up. Um, but in a simple controlled system of the sort shown on the diagram, that is certainly the case. And why is that? It's relatively intuitively uh, straightforward. I think we've produced these radio waves, remember, by causing electrons to oscillate up and down in this piece of wire. So we are controlling the direction of oscillation of the electric field. Right? It has to be lined up with the oscillating charges, the electrons in this piece of wire. That's where it's coming from. The magnetic field variation is then a function of nature at right angles to that. Right? But it's the electric field that is being controlled here. The magnetic field is, is constrained thereafter to be at right angles to that. And we get to the receiving area, well, we've got to make electrons oscillate again. Because that's what we're picking up as a radio signal. That's what we're going to amplify and convert uh, back to an output. Okay, so this aerial has to be aligned with that aerial for us to have the chance of getting electrons oscillating up and down uh, in that receiving aerial cable. Okay, turn it at right angles and, and all we're doing is moving electrons side to side in here. We're not generating an alternating current in the wire. We're just bouncing them backwards and forwards from one side of the cable to the other. So, polarization in, in radio signals, I think, relatively straightforward. Um, microwaves, it's going to look a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but hopefully you'll see where it's coming from. All right, it's counterintuitive because it's not looking like that silly cartoon that we had uh, way, way back when I first introduced polarization. So we cannot just select out through a slit one particular direction of oscillation. And what's happening with microwaves, and these arrows are showing just the electric field, all right? So there's a magnetic field oscillating uh, at right angles to that. This is only talking about the electric field in this diagram for reasons that I think will become self-evident. But all we've got to set up really is a grid of wires. So this is basically a frame with a whole lot of wires strung across it from one side to the, to the next. And that will be our polarizer for microwaves. I'll try and set up some demonstration experiments uh, for this later on if I can get the kit because it's quite instructive. We can do all the basic stuff that we've talked about, right? Reflection, uh, refraction, polarization, everything uh, using microwaves. So it's quite useful. Um, but if these cables are actually lined up with the electric field of our EM wave, then actually we get a minimum of transmission, right? Whereas if our electric field is at right angles to the wire, we actually get very good transmission. So basically, this is, this is a polarization effect. But the way it's working is through absorption. If we've got our electric field oscillations in this direction, then actually what they're doing, exactly the same as with radio waves, they're actually causing electrons to oscillate up and down in these wires. So basically, energy is going to be taken out of the microwaves in moving those electrons. And essentially, you're going to be heating the wires up. Right? You all know that metallic objects in a microwave cooker heat up. Right? That's why you don't put posh teacups with gold leaf on them. 
right, in microwaves because you'll get some quite remarkable effects associated with the gold leaf. Won't do your posh tea set any good at all. Um, but it's the same sort of effect here. So it's absorbing the energy from the microwaves and not transmitting them. This way, again, analogous to our radio waves, all we're doing is causing the electrons to oscillate from side to side in the wire. So there's less absorption going on, less heating of the wire, in other words, and we actually still get microwaves coming through the other side. So it sort of looks counterintuitive in the sense that, you know, we line our electric field up with the wires and we don't get anything through. But there is a reasonably straightforward physical explanation for it. Well, we can do it with visible light as well, and you'll all have seen um, polarising filters uh, before. <coughs> Excuse me, in sunglasses, if nowhere else. Um, but that's essentially a polarised polarizing lens simply has an optically active molecule in it that's, you know, and they're all lined up in a particular direction. So again, it's going to allow the electric vector of our magnetic field through uh, in one direction but not another. Right? So it'll absorb the other ones, basically, the other direction. And that essentially is then letting through only light that has an electric field in a particular direction. It's absorbing all the others. And sunglasses are set up uh, to take uh, into account the fact that light that's being reflected off surfaces will often be, in fact almost always be, polarised. The electric field will always be in one direction. So sunlight reflected off water, which is the classic thing for polarising sunglasses, will have the electric field aligned in one particular direction. You'll do all this, I think, in stage two, in some detail, uh, why this happens. Um, so if you set your, all of your polarised sunglasses up, and they all are, all around the world, in exactly the same way, whatever the maker, in the right way, it preferentially cuts out that direction of polarisation, right? But allows other stuff through. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's fairly straightforward. Um, uh, have I? Yes, I have. I've um, got a couple of polarised, uh, polarising pieces of plastic here. So that's, you know, that's straightforward. But it also means that we've got immediately uh, a system whereby we can tell... Let's, I'm going to use this piece, uh, which I hate doing. It seems like moving back to the iron edge. It's quite useful as a source of light. Uh, how far would this go? That should do. So let's try and project it on the screen. We should be able to see the effect, I think, even with the other stuff on there. All right, so if we put one polarizing filter in, Right, we get all we're doing is, is taking out directions of polarization that are not aligned with where, whatever the molecules are in this piece of plastic. If we put another one on, well, we just get double the effect. We've got a little bit more absorption there. All right, but if I twist this through 90 degrees, by definition, it's now going to take out everything that this one is allowing through. All right, so if I rotate that through 90 degrees. Well, it's hard to tell on there. Can you just about see? There's a change of brightness. I'm afraid this is coming up the screen in all sorts of directions. From here, it's relatively straightforward. I wonder if we do it. Um, if it's easier in front of the screen. Uh, I don't know. Can you see that behind the filter? It's sort of black in that orientation. If I twist one of them back round so that they're aligned in roughly the same way, you get quite a bit of light coming through. Okay? But if, if they're at 90 degrees, nothing comes through. 
Okay, because we've basically we've made sure the first one has made sure that all our electric vectors are aligned in some direction or other. Let's, let's say vertical. The second one is actually now take, only allowing, because it's at 90 degrees, the electric vector to be in that direction. So by definition, now nothing is allowed through, um, and we end up with, with with darkness, as it were. Except, of course, now we have the makings of a of an instrument. And there were some actually very, some very successful scientific instruments produced on this principle. Because, of course, now anything you put in between these two that changes the direction of polarization of light going through it will now require that you change the angle of that second one a little bit in order to cut the light back out again. So if you can measure that angle, you've measured some physical property of whatever the material was between these two lenses. And this was a really uh, common way, for instance, of measuring the strength of some uh, sugar solutions, for instance. Right? Dextrose is called dextrose because it rotates the angle of polarization to the right, right? depending on which direction you're looking at it. But, right? It comes from the Latin for right. Okay, and you can actually measure then the strength of a solution. So it's really useful in, um, you know, some medical processes, for instance, for assaying uh, solutions. You can also use it in engineering. I'm going to see if this will work. Let's, let's try it out. Um, actually, might be better off going back to the plane. Than this. So it's definitely not going to show up on the recording. Right, so here's our <coughs> two lenses at right angles to each other, not a lot coming through. Yeah. If I put something, this is just a plastic room, right? Put something in between that rotates the direction of polarization. You can see odd bits of coloured light coming through there. Right, and that's simply because the way this has been shaped and formed, there are stresses around. Uh, edges, right? So if I increase the stress a little bit more, let me see, right? So I try and flex it and twist it. The white levels are changing as they come through. And that's just me imposing stress on a piece of plastic. And that will rotate the angle of polarization of the light going through. So again, it proved to be quite a useful uh, tool in engineering. Um, just a pair of polarizing lenses. Lindsay's and the light source.